The following story has been brought to you by storiestoinspire.org. Rebbe Wadish, my boss in the summer times, old boss in the summer times, I used to run a day camp in New York for many years. I was the high counselor over there. So Rebbe Wadish was my boss. He was the director of the camp. Um, he told me when he made a wedding for one of his first kids, Reb David Feinstein and Reb Ruvain Feinstein showed up to the wedding. Now, I don't know if you know, Reb David Feinstein, Reb Ruvain Feinstein, these are the Gidolei Hadar, the children of Reb Moshe Feinstein, both well into their 80s. They showed up to this wedding. Now, when the Gidolei Hadar show up to your wedding uninvited, that's shocking. So Reb Wadish went over to the other side and said, why didn't you tell me that you were inviting the Gidolei Hadar? We would have given them Berachot, we would have given them Kibud, we would have given them something. And the other side just shook their head and said, I can't believe it. They actually showed up. So what do you mean they actually showed up? Well, we didn't invite them, but they showed up. He's like, what are you talking about? He said, oh, we have to tell you why they're here. The other side, their family's grandfather, meaning the mother's father, years before, he used to live, not used to live, he used to work around MTJ, the school of Reb Moshe Feinstein on the Lower East Side. And whenever they needed help inside the school, electric work, things along those lines, this lady's grandfather, a Sephardic Jew, was very handy with all these different types of plumbing and electric work, and he would go and he would help them. One day, he was driving home for Shabbat from Manhattan to where he lived in Long Island. On his way home, he stopped somewhere, and unfortunately, he stopped in the Bronx, and unfortunately, there was a drive-by shooting, and he got shot, and he was murdered on Friday afternoon. Died. This is before cell phones. The family had no idea what happened to him. Finally, Motzeh Shabbat, the cops put together who the guy is, and they got a phone call. We're sorry to tell you this, but your father passed away. At the Levaya, at the funeral, Reb Moshe Feinstein stood up to speak, and he said, This was such a tzaddik. He was such a tzaddik. Remember last time was Abud. He was such a tzaddik that... All the years that we called and asked him to help us with the electric and with the plumbing inside the yeshiva, he refused to take payment. He refused to take a dime for it. Therefore, Rabbi Moshe said to the crowd, I have a karata tov to him, and I will personally go to every single one of his children and grandchildren's weddings until the day that I die. I have a karata tov, and I will go. Your grandfather, your father won't be there to dance at your wedding, and in his place, I hope that my humble shoulders can take his place at your wedding. And sure enough, Rav Moshe Feinstein showed up. But listen how beautiful this is. His 80-year-old children, Reb David Feinstein and Reb Ruven Feinstein said, if our father felt akaratatov to this family, so then the entire Feinstein family has akaratatov to your family. And so therefore, it's not just something that my father took on. Reb Dov and Reb Ruvain said, they're in their 80s. They're Russia Yeshivot. They have the entire America on their shoulders. Good luck trying to book them to speak. Good luck trying to anything. They're so busy. But Akarat HaTov, a tenet, something that is the reality and the foundation of a Jew, they showed up to their wedding. But it goes deeper. Showing somebody Akarat HaTov. The same Rabbi Wadish. He and I went, it was two summers ago, we went to New Jersey, we brought the, the yeshiva, we brought the yeshiva, we brought the camp to a certain rabbi in New Jersey during the nine days to get a beracha. And afterwards, the camp went off to some activities, and Rebel Adish and I, we were going to go back to Brooklyn to go run the rest of the camp. On our way back, there's a pizza store over there. And Rebel Adish said, Ari, he pulled over to the side. He said, I want to go in and say thank you to the guy behind the counter because for years, we've been sending our camp to Great Adventures in New Jersey, and the guy behind the counter for years has been taking our order, and I'd like to go, he's like, never here around this. Let me go in and say thank you. Rebel time. one of the greatest mistakes of my life is I stayed in the car. I remember clearly, I had a speech that night in Great Neck. I stayed in the car, I had my material, I had to prepare the speech. I wish I would have gone in. Because about 10 minutes later, Rebel Dish came back to the car, and his eyes were all like, oh, tear it up. And I, this, this speech gets me. And I'm like, is everything okay? And he said to me, Ari, yeah, I got to tell you what just happened. He walked up and it's very busy. It's the nine days. And we know during the nine days, nobody eats meat, right? You only eat milk. So it's a pizza shop in Lakewood. It's very, very busy. 
And uh, so you have a lot of people working behind the counter. Mayhem. Place is packed. Babies are crying. It's crazy. Rabbi Adish walks up to the counter and he says to the first guy, is Chaim here? Is Chaim, one second. Now let me say, Chaim, you here? Huh? And the guy comes out. He's flustered. He's got everything, the world on his shoulders. He comes walking up. He's like, yes, how can I help you? He said, Shalom Aleichem. I'm Rabbi Wadish. And he said, okay. He said, I'm Shlomo Wadish. Solomon Wadish. And he remembered from the credit card. He's like, I'm Camp Sharim. He said, that's right. He said, I just came to tell you, thank you so much. The pizza is always so delicious. All those years that my boys go to great adventures, they always look forward to you sending them pizza. And I just wanted to tell you, I was in town, show you a karata top. Thank you. I know you hear these stories, but this actually happened. In the middle of the pizza shop, the guy broke down and started crying. Couldn't the guy, all the pressure and everything, just a flood of tears. And he like jumped over the counter and hugged Rabbi Wadish with all his might. Just hugged him. It's like, whoa, okay. And he said to Rabbi Wadish, look around. Nobody says thank you anymore. Nobody really says thank you. He said, you know how hard my job is? And nobody says thank you. Nobody. So he said, Rabbi Wadish, thank you for saying thank you. And he's like, can I give you a pie of pizza for free? <laughs> he was like offering him food and food. And Rabbi Wadish was on a diet, so he didn't take. And I said, Rabbi, I'm not on a diet. <laughs> Two hour drive back to... When you go and you start to show somebody a karata tov, it's amazing. It's amazing what you can do for somebody else. It's amazing the words. When you show somebody a karata tov, you can ask my wife. Whenever I get an email from somebody saying, Rabbi, thank you for a certain class, or somebody even yelling at me, Rabbi, I hated your certain class. I take both of those as a karata tov. Honestly, like, thank you. Thank you for letting me know. There's so much work, you know goes into it. And when you give somebody else a thank you, when you let somebody else know, thank you. Wow. It's amazing. It's incredible. A student of mine's mother, Baruch Hashem, her son got engaged. And I happened to have been in town then for the engagement. This is back when I lived in Israel, but I, I was in town. And so Baruch Hashem, I got the chance to go to the engagement of one of my very close students. We were dancing. We're happy. We're laughing. It's time for me to go. When I walk out, the mother, his mom stops me and she says, can, can I talk to you for a few minutes? I said, sure. I was standing on the porch outside the front. And she said to me, you know my story, right? You know our story. You know our past. You know our background. I said, I do. Unfortunately, his, his parents had gotten divorced. His mother wanted to be more religious. His father didn't really want to have much to do with the religion. And it became such a strain that they ended up getting a divorce. But something incredible happened, though. It was a bunch of boys in the family. And the mother now had to figure out how she's going to make a living. But Baruch Hashem, at least it was the payment each month, the alimony, the payment from the husband to be able to take care of the kids. And she told me that that was their lifeline. That's what she was paying rent with. That's what she was literally feeding her children with. Because she had never worked. She'd never had a job. And then the divorce came and she didn't know. So until she can get on her, that alimony was everything. Thing is, they had shared custody. And what that means is, is that he gets them for a weekend, she gets them for a weekend. Open up your hearts, everybody. After a month, she realized, oh no, my children, I'm sending them to a house that doesn't keep Shabbat every, every other week. What should I do? So she called him up and she asked, maybe we can switch days. Nothing doing. He said, I work very hard the whole week. My weekends are the only time you're not having my kids on the weekend. She didn't know what to do. She can't send her kids to a place where they're not keeping Shabbat. Either. She said to me, Rabbi, it got to the point that I knew exactly what I had to do. Friday afternoon, he pulled up in front of the house. I walked down to the car. I told him, roll down the window. I said to him, please, let me take Shabbat for the kids. He said, no, they're mine on the weekends. They're mine. She said, I'll buy Shabbat from you. He said, what do you mean? She said, I'll give up all the alimony. I'll give up all the support. You don't have to give another dime. I'll buy Shabbat from you. He said, you're going to give it all up? She said, yeah. At that point, I thought in the story, an Abba, a father who would, you know, nothing new. He said, deal. The kids came down. He said, guys, you're not coming to me. I'll see you next week at some point. And he drove away thrilled with the millions in the future, you know, all the money that he's now kept. And she walked away thrilled with the millions of mitzvot that she now had. 
She told me I sent my kids to shul every week. She became a secretary by a doctor's office, and she was making pittance. She was making nothing. She begged all the Jewish schools to take her kids for free, and they did. She said every Shabbat, because I bought their Shabbat, that was my mitzvah, I said, you're going to shul. She said there was one day a year, one day, that I said to them they didn't have to go. On some Chara Torah, they came over to me before we went down, and they said, we don't want to go. So said, you're going to shul. So we don't want to go. Why not? So we don't have a shoulder to sit on to dance. We don't have an Abba to dance with us. She said, that was the one time I didn't send them. But all the other time, I sent them. I'm getting very emotional now, but then I was a basket case, this story. Really. But I was wondering, why is she telling me all this? So she said, Rabbi, it took me years. I finally got a good job, and I finally started to make money. She said, and now... I want to show Hakarat Tov to all the rabbis who have ever made an impact on my children. Those schools that took my kids for free, I showed them Hakarat Tov. I gave them back whatever I could. She said, and now there's one rabbi left. There's just you. She put her hand into her purse. She took out a sweaty wad of money that you can tell she's been saving. She put it in my hand. She said, thank you. I said, I can't take that. She said, I said I'm not. I'm not taking it. She said, don't you run some kind of programs in Israel? Don't you have? I said, yeah, well, it'll go for that. But I have to show Akarat Tov because I brought up my children the entire time. The lifeline that we had was, I told them, you see, the school took you for free. One day you pay them back. You see that this camp took you for one day you pay them back. And I'm telling you, each one of her children are more beautiful than the next. Because of this midah of Akarat Tov, of showing somebody how amazing it is that you gave them something. Living a life of being thankful. Don't, don't ever, ever do something for somebody and remember it. Don't. Don't do something for somebody else and remember it. The moment you did something for somebody else, forget it. They don't owe you a thing. Do it because you're a yid, because you love, because you give, because you're going in God's ways. Just like God has mercy, you had mercy, you gave, forget it. If somebody did something for you, you live your life being thankful to give it back. And if all of us would do that together, huh, Mashiach wouldn't be able to come fast enough. Enjoyed this story? Come again. Bring a friend. Stories to inspire dot org.